welcome and thank Professor Philomus Miranda Mumford for joining us today. Um, she's a health economist and she's um, come to bring a reflection on the day's um, proceedings and she's also read the report from the previous seminar and kept abreast. In fact, she was absolutely integral. The first conversation I had about this idea of a seminar series before I even contacted my co applicators was a, a chat with Miranda and she said yes. Um, an, interdisciplinary <laughs> an interdisciplinary approach to something like that sounds brilliant. Um, and Miranda has worked on numerous collaborative international, national, local research projects with many colleagues across the social sciences um, on a range of health and social policy topics. And her teaching interests were in developing these interdisciplinary units <coughs> at all levels to incorporate economics, economic dimensions and to develop high level capacity to research and understanding research in the field of economics and health. And in the very recent past, she's been both joint convener and former chair of the Campbell and Cochrane Collaboration of Economics Methods Group, as well as chair of the steering group of the UEA NHS Economic Support Programme, and chair of the advisory committee of the NHS Economic Evaluations Database at the University of York. Um, she has many articles to her name, but I thought of interest to this audience might be her publication with others on the social and economic costs of food allergies in Europe, in the Journal of Health Services Research and Evidence-Based Decisions and Economics, Healthcare, Social Welfare, Education, and Criminal Justice in 2008. And I also want to say Miranda is a um, chaplain here at UEA, a very interesting person to know, and I'm delighted she's here with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, this is the end of a long and really, really interesting day. Thank you to the organizers. <laughs> and um, uh, I my mind's been fairly blown, so I'm going to give you a fairly um, um, disjointed and hopefully quite short talk. As I was preparing for this, not having heard what was going to be said and discussed, um, I, I'm afraid that what will come out in my slide is a bit of a lecture on health economics and economic methodology, and I, I've been trying to suppress that, because you know, when you've done it a lot, it just comes out of the system. Um, and what I'd like to do is to just reflect on what's happened today and many people have, have touched on economic issues that you can't not, it is the economy, stupid. <laughs> That's, you know, the, the economy, economy is all of us and how we, how we interact and um, understanding it is something that economists actually don't do very well. And I think this is where the interdisciplinary research and the future for a lot of the sociological questions that are coming out of this may come from, and that sociologists are far better equipped to look at. So I'm just going to try and go through this and try and pick up on things that I've heard today as I go through. Um, I suppose I should use the mouse. I grew up before mice appeared, this kind of mouse anyway. I did have a pet one once, but not this one. Wrong um, key. I also have a different kind of computer, it doesn't have lots of... Yeah, you might have a Yes, there you go. What I'm going to do is just quickly talk about what an economist's framework is. And then um, talk about economic evaluation. And then which is one little thing that economists do, but I've done quite a lot of, and it's been my specialty. And then, uh, just, I've got three examples. Uh, food allergy is one of the ones that um, Charlotte to mention, but um, from my own work. And then I've just got some questions that have sort of emerged during this process. Um, so, starting with the sort of economics framework, um, Economics is really about the role of, the, 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 the difference between e economics and other research, I suppose, is that it's always, in some way, involving how resources are allocated between people. So resources. Um, and that happens through a process of balancing of demand, which is the needs and wants, and the supply, which is how resources and what's needed is, the, is produced products. And actually throughout the day, the balance between demand and supply has been a key underlying issue. 
um, and demand comes from all sorts of places, and supply comes from all sorts of places, and decisions are made in different ways. But that's what um, is at the basis of economics. Um, and one of the ways in which demand and supply even themselves out is through the bargaining process that people call markets. And there's lots of political philosophy about whether markets are a good thing or not, um, and whether free markets actually produce the most efficient and optimal allocation of resources, which of course it doesn't, um, because um, all the conditions for a perfect market where every um, product is sold and every want is met, uh, they, don't, they can't exist and they don't exist, and so we have market failure and health and healthcare are particular examples where that happens. And one, one, one of the reasons for market failure is public good, and public goods are where treating a few individuals may be good for every body, and that's true of infectious disease, for example. Um, and so the who, who's, who's good are you meeting? <coughs> The person who is good you're meeting, the, treat, the person who is treated would be the person who paid, but actually the benefit is for the whole of society. So, I mean, there's lots and lots of issues of market failure. And so, in public decision making, politi political decision making, some countries come to the conclusion that you need to provide a public health service because the market in healthcare doesn't work for the whole population. Uh, but that varies as to how that happens. And in fact, in the United States, the United States government spends more on public socialized health care than Britain does mm. per head. So we tend to think of the USA as a private health system, but it, it is, it does have. But uh, they also have a very large um, public health system. So but international comparisons can be quite interesting. Um, and also, actually, going back to markets, healthcare and health-related um, economic activity accounts for a very large part of the um, gross domestic product of most countries in the developed world, and it increases, the proportion increases as countries have more, um, more to spend. Um, and the movement of health from out of informal networks into professional um, networks. Um, so social intervention is, is um, <coughs> said, you know, that it's, it's considered essential. The information and asymmetry is another aspect of the market failure that the, one of the assumptions of free markets is that everybody knows everything. Consumers and suppliers know everything about the product they're buying. And in the case of healthcare, we've been discussing what people know and what they understand. And that goes for both doctors and, or clinicians and patients. And the, I mean, one of the things that interests me is that patients know an awful lot more than clinicians about some aspects and vice versa. So it's not necessarily the clinician knows best. Uh, and um, there is a whole range of economic theory around clinical um, agency for the patient. Uh, but that's kind of an old-fashioned view. So this whole area is an area that's, to my mind, it's not. It's something that exists. But it could be a. It could be a topic for interdisciplinary, again, potential research. <coughs> Everything I say, I think would spark off a question. Um, so the public, the, um, the, the public health system doesn't have a market, so the market doesn't just decide how things are spent, where money goes and, and what's provided. So there has to be a system, and there are, in, in um, most countries now, health technology assessment agencies who look at new, emerging, and even current spending on health service particular aspects and, and look at the value for money. And one of the methods they use for that decision, apart from does it work, which is where systematic reviews of trials come in, is economic evaluation. 
and it has evolved. It, it, it started out as a sort of a range of techniques in the 50s and 60s, um, cost-benefit analysis, cost-effectiveness analysis, but it's been specialised for healthcare. And there's a, we use something called cost-utility analysis, where we look at the cost of achieving an additional quality of adjusted life year. And it has a whole range of steps. And time's flying on, and I'll just read this out. But um, firstly, you need to specify quite carefully which technology you're looking at and in what context. Um, so if it's a diagnostic technology, it might be you have to, when you're looking at the costs of providing a diagnostic technology, it's not just the price of the test from the factory or the, <coughs> the lab. It's the staff involved, the counselling involved, the, all the sort of interactions that the health service will need to provide information and so on. Um, and you then need to define the perspectives of the evaluation. So you're looking at the, um, is, this just from, is, is it just the health service that's, looking at the, that's incurring costs? Or are you looking at a societal view where you're looking at what are the costs of the um, patients, clients, whatever you want to call them, attending this particular test? Um, you know, how far are they having to drive? In Norfolk, that's quite a significant question. Um, also, the time horizon. So, are you looking at the short-term cost-effectiveness of, um, you know, um, how much does it cost to um, screen, breast screen, you know, a thousand women, and, um, or are you looking at the long-term survival of those women and the cost? and benefits of having had a screening test. Um, the care pathways include the subsequent pathways, so you need to understand what happens after diagnosis. And we often use a technique, uh, an anal analytic approach called decision analysis. Now this has problems for me and everybody, I'm sure, because we're, we're, we're dichotomizing uh, and we're classifying, as we've had this discussion already today, about the, the risks of, or the dangers of classification um, becoming ossified. Um, so, but we necessarily have to do it in order to do the calculations of probabilities and costs and benefits. <coughs> um, we have to define, define the desired final outcomes, and I've talked about all these quality adjusted life years, but they are measured in a range of ways, and even if they're measured in the sort of current best practice way, they don't include distributional issues, social, um, there may be a preference for um, preferring um, to treat people in deprived circumstances. Well, that doesn't come in unless it's been specified as part of the decision process, but it wouldn't necessarily be allowed for in this evaluation. There isn't a waiting system. There are people working on equity in economic evaluation, but that's on the research table still. Um, so even if you decide, define the desired final outcomes, there might not be a tool for measuring them. But then you need to measure and estimate probabilities of benefits and resource use. So you've got your alternatives, you've got your costs, you've got your benefits, and you can do a little sum. And your second step is estimating and comparing the cost based on all those assumptions or decisions. So you can see how contingent any cost-effectiveness decision is. And there was a, a medical economist from the States in the 80s who said, once you've seen one cost-effectiveness analysis, you've seen one cost-effectiveness analysis. <laughs> <laughs> they are incredibly contextual. But you can do epidemiological literature review and see how that varies over time between places, and you actually can learn something from making comparisons of published cost-effectiveness work. If you, if you are a nerd like me. <laughs> um, so, so that's the sort of thing that my <coughs> National Institute of Clinical Excellence and other health technology assessment agencies are asking us to do. And we're basing it on the literature. What's available? Um, at the 
time the decision needs to be made. And there is a, a conundrum which is that the decision needs to be made about spending before any evidence emerges. And um, so economists are often being asked to do back of the envelope speculation about cost effectiveness before any trials get funded <coughs> um, and so on. And so it's terribly important when we're doing it. And, if, and at the late stage where the results from the trials come in, we can do cost effectiveness, but we do often do cost effectiveness analyses based on um, the technology having been evaluated and there's lots of good evidence and it's a very tight confidence interval on the cost effectiveness. But the um, decision there has been made. It's out there. It's being used. And even if it was a trial, if it's a stage three, stage four trial in practice, so many people have seen it happening. And if the result is even slightly positive, everybody wants it. So the decision to withdraw it on grounds of cost effectiveness is highly unlikely at that stage. Um, so um, <coughs> that, that, that's, um, that's an example of a, a, a kind of a willingness to pay is always um, less than, you know, willingness to accept compensation has to be more than willingness to pay to buy something. It's the difference between sellers and buyers' prices generally, that, um, that, and going backwards, losing something is worse than deciding to start something scratch. <coughs> so my three examples of work that I've done were pregnancy, uh, neonatal care work that I did in the 80s and 90s, and genetics. I, I was the economics grant holder for the Cambridge Genetics Knowledge Park um, for five years. Um, and supervised a Department of Health research fellow who worked on that, and then food allergy. And there are just a few observations I just wanted to make about that. Um, the, the perinatal research I did, uh, particularly on the neonatal care, in the early 80s, um, this was around categorization that um, in order to interpret differences in perinatal mortality in different places, it was important to know how many of the babies were born very preterm or very low birth weight, because they had a much higher risk of dying. Um, they are the, the tail of the distribution. And um, in those days, certainly in the early, late 70s, um, it was probably considered by about midwives, but obstetricians and neonatologists, they didn't have neonatologists in, in many places. They, it was considered that um, a baby born at um, 28, 20 to 30 or 40 weeks would be, was going to die. Um, and if they didn't, that's great, and they'd do what they could, but there wasn't much facility. Um, and that's changed, obviously. And the process of change with the introduction of neonatal intensive care has actually changed the expectations of everybody concerned and the way the services are organized. So now, um, every um, midwifery delivery, place of delivery has to have a protocol more or less for what to do if the baby can't breathe um, and how they're going to get to the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, and that's in the process in the space of 30 years. Things have changed dramatically and the amount of resources that have gone into that have been enormous, but so have um, mortality rates gone down and, and the chances of survival and impairment free survival have increased a lot. Now. So all that's changed, but what it means is that whereas in the 70s um, screening and diagnosis for preterm delivery were relatively um, low priority, um, that's all kind of followed on, now that a baby can... I, I'm not sure which came first, to be honest, but I think it's a, it's a question for debate, but it, what the point of this really is that there's always shifting boundaries going on, and that as one thing becomes possible, then diagnosis of that, or treat, you know, that the diagnosis of the candidates for that treatment become, becomes more important. Um, and 
indeed takes over in some cases. When we're talking about ultrasound with Jane Sandel earlier, <laughs> but it can be um, a lot. In the case of genetics, um, we got involved um, here with the Cambridge Genetics Knowledge Park. It actually, should have been called the East of England K uh, Genetics Knowledge Park. Um, but um, because of the genome uh, mapping for the human, suddenly the government got excited because we must get in there because something's going to happen. We're going to make discoveries, and they're going to be healthcare interventions linked to those, and therefore we. Um, are going to employ an economist to work out what's the cost effectiveness of that. Um, this was, it's interesting to know that the genetics knowledge part wasn't just funded by the Department of Health, but also by the Department for Industry, or whatever it was called then, forgotten. And um, the, um, the tools that we had were simply um, to, to be economists and to look at what was going on and to say, well, you know, we can do cost effectiveness analysis alongside interventions, but they didn't have interventions specifically. Um, we could help them look at the costs of illness and the potential value of prevention. Um, but I think the main, we, we actually, we did, a, we did some solid work on cystic fibrosis um, treatment because cystic fibrosis is one of the furthest advanced forms of you know, genetic knowledge detection, screening. Um, but the, um, and also potential genetic, um, um, it, manipulation of the genes in the lungs to actually improve performance as possible treatments. Um, so that was just, we didn't get very far there but there was a question of whether a new kind of economics was needed and I think actually the question was more of a new kind of <coughs> understanding of what's going on with genetic testing and availability of <coughs> information and that it was the sociological aspects that were of more uh, currently it, we, we, that economics needs a defined product and a defined market in a sense and that in order for those to emerge it's not um, it's not easy for us to then start predicting changes in the economy as a result of it. In food allergy, um, I think that um, many, there's a very, a very high percentage of the population think they've got some kind of food allergy. Um, actually, um, they may have food problems, food-related problems, but the allergic allergy, the IgE moderated allergy, is quite relatively rare. Um, but there's a public perception of risk because of um, being children having to use EpiPens for peanut allergy and so on. And there are enough of them around that everybody probably knows somebody who's been affected. And they're affected by public safety rules, which, for example, headmistresses may say, you're not allowed to bring peanuts to school because we've got an allergic child in the school and that affects the whole school. Um, so the incidence actually is lower. Um, the epidemiology was quite limited, but I was involved in a European study that had a big epidemiological component. And on the piggybacked onto that, we did an economic survey of health costs. Um, and we found that perceived allergy raises <coughs> healthcare costs, but once they have a diagnosis, actually that settles down because they've got a, a the management pattern is clear, um, and they're less likely to use intensive care um, or the other factors. Um, and also their household costs, actually that wasn't so different. Um, they were doing more food avoidance before, and once they know what they've got, which, which foods they can have, they actually increase their spending again and start going out uh, more and so on. So it's not necessarily one way or another, but it's an interesting the Dutch group did the household survey. But what's interesting also is that from the economics point of view, we're not just interested in the consumers, but also the industry and how they cope. And the food industry um, have big costs related to the risks of food allergy because they recall <coughs> products, it's going to cause a problem, which is a major thing. 
especially for global companies. Um, and their labeling questions are very important, and that's a big debate as to how people understand what's in the foods. Um, and then the other aspect is um, the industry issue on diagnostic um, provision, and that's something I haven't um, mentioned so far. So some of the questions that have arisen are, which are in a sense subjects for future research, possible interdisciplinary research, do we understand what drives production and supply of diagnostics and the industry has been emerging? Um, do we understand what drives the demand? We've talked about that a lot today, the different types of diagnoses. How do new diagnostic options change thresholds of illness? Again, that's been a core subject for today. And of, of what are acceptable outcomes? And how will people use diagnostic services in the future? And um, this is where understanding and also understanding where healthcare will fit in. Um, this is the shifting, you know, how do we engage with the internet and use it and how do we discuss that with health providers. <coughs> so, and the final question was, um, can we understand the applicability and shelf life of advice that we give to HTA panels? And that goes back to my question of looking at the epidemiology of cost-effectiveness analyses, that actually some of the things that we think of as cost-effective may no longer be so, and that just needs to be rerun frequently. Thank you.